Hello, I'm Alfonso Severos from Second Saturday. Right now you are watching Health and Wellness with Rose and Green. You can't keep doing the same things over and over again and expect a different result. And we have to have clear thinking, so we have to have the nerves flowing properly. So the spine is very important. So the spine needs to be corrected. Welcome to another episode of Health and Wellness. I'm your host, Dr. Rosen Green. Today's episode, we'll be speaking with Don Simmons. He'll be sharing an inspiring and empowering story. Let's take a look. My name is Don Simmons. Um, I am 58 years old. I've been writing poetry since like the spring of 1986 or the spring of 1987. So that's about like 36 years that I've been writing poetry. Well, the first thing that happened, I was walking in Midtown Manhattan in 1992. It was nighttime and somebody stabbed me in the heart. Like some guy, some disturbed person just stabbed me right through the heart. I still have the scar right there over my heart. And there was many times I went to the hospital where I told them that I felt that my heart was giving me problems and they just totally dismissed it. No, you're doing too many push-ups. You're doing too much exercise. But I knew it was something else because I know what cardiac pain feels like. I've had it before. This is a part one in the part two series with Don Simmons. Wow, inspiring. Hello, I'm Alfonso Severos from Second Saturday. Right now you are watching Health and Wellness with Rose and Green. When your health started failing, what transpired before your heart started failing? Well, the first thing that happened, I was walking in Midtown Manhattan in 1992. It was nighttime and somebody stabbed me in the heart. Like some guy, some disturbed person just stabbed me right through the heart. I still have the scar right there over my heart. And so they said that I died like three or four times in the ambulance and they were able to bring me back. And like um, the LAD, which is, I think, the lower ascending, a lower something, it's the artery, one of the main arteries of the heart. It got completely cut in half. And 99% of the people that sustain that kind of damage to the heart, they don't survive. Mm. I don't know why I survived, but I did. I remember opening up my eyes three days later and I had all these tubes, like everywhere. They had me sedated, though, so I was kind of like out of it but I could feel the tubes all over my body. Eight days in the hospital, they let me go home with no health care, nothing, no aftercare. The only thing they did was take out the stitches from the operation. They gave me no other kind of care at all. So, fast forward, because that happened in 1992 in September. Fast forward to 1993 is when I went to prison. And like around 1995, in prison, I remember I was playing basketball. And I remember I became so out of breath that I thought I was actually going to die on the basketball court. I had to actually lay down on the basketball court because I was just so tired. I didn't realize that my heart was still healing. So I didn't really think that I was gonna really be able to work out. But after, I don't know, maybe several months, I started working out again. I had a heavy workout. I was able to lift 525 pounds off the floor with no warm-up, wow. with no warm-up and no belt, just some, some good chalk on the hands, right. a, good bar, a good grip on the bar, right. and strength, right. and, I, and I did it. And I worked out like every single day I worked out in prison, wow. every day, even when it was raining, though it was hard. Right. And so I did my 10 years in prison. I felt very strong when I came home from prison. Mentally strong, physically strong. But for some reason, my mother told me, she said, when you walk up the stairs, she said, I can hear you wheezing. I said, no, that can't be true. I'm strong, I just came home. And my mother wanted me to go to the doctor, so I did. I went to a neighborhood clinic. And he told me that my EKG was very abnormal. So I said, well, I know it's abnormal because I was stabbed. He said, well, I still want you to go to a cardiologist. Yes. So I went to a Wyckoff Medical Center in Brooklyn. And 
I was there for a while, for a few hours. Nobody's saying anything to me. Nobody's coming to talk to me. So I started to get a little nervous. I was like, why hasn't nobody came to talk to me yet? I see people peeking around the corner. They're pointing at me. They're talking. And then finally they came over to me and said, Mr. Simmons, your EKG is abnormal. And I said the same thing. I was stabbed. They said, no, it's, it's more than that. And they sent me to Columbia Presbyterian Cornell Wow on 70th Street and York Avenue. And they did some tests and found that I had blockages. And it's probably the scar tissue from being stabbed. It, it, it like blocked my, my, my arteries in my heart. So that was in 2003. I had a bypass. Um, it was hard. <clears throat> there was times that I thought about suicide because I was in so much pain. You know, I told my mother that I feel like jumping out the window. She was like, boy, you better, you better have faith in God. And I did. I, I kept my faith, but the pain was tremendous. But I recovered. And there was many times I went to the hospital where I told them that I felt that my heart was giving me problems. And they just totally dismissed it. No, you're doing too many push-ups. You're doing too much exercise. But I knew it was something else because I know what cardiac pain feels like. I've had it before. And it got to the point where in 2018, I just couldn't catch my breath. I could not, I was urinating on myself because I could not catch my breath. My, my feet were swelling up, my ankles were swelling up like, to the, like, like balloons because my body was retaining fluids because of my heart. So they kept me in a hospital in Brooklyn many times and I asked God for a miracle because I knew in, in my heart I knew that I was dying. Yeah. I could feel it. I could feel the life leaving my body. So I asked God for a miracle and my mom came up to visit me from her town, from Maryland. I spoke to my sister and it was like, you know, they don't listen to your brother. He tells them that he's not feeling well, but they don't do anything about it. And um, my sister spoke to the doctors and the nurses. So after my mom and sister left, I said that I want to speak to my cardiologist. And when he came to my room, I just told him straight, listen, I can't catch my breath. And he came back like two days later. <clears throat> and he told me, there's nothing else we can do for you here. So my heart sank at first. It was like one of the lowest feelings that I've ever had. I was like, yo, these people are just going to let me die here. And they're not going to do anything to help me. But he came back like a day later and said, we're sending you to another hospital which turned out to be Mount Sinai. I went there, back and forth there a few times. And on the third time, I went back home and the same thing happened again. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, I couldn't, even, sit, I couldn't even sleep sitting up. I couldn't sleep at all because I couldn't breathe. So basically I had to stay awake all night because I can't catch my breath. And it was starting to get to me not being able to breathe. So I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna even waste any time. I knew they weren't gonna take me in an ambulance to um, Mount Sinai, so I took a cab all the way from Bushwick, I mean, all the way from Cypress Hills, all the way to 101st Street. With the heart condition. Yes, and I told the cab driver, if you see anything happen to me, just take me to the nearest hospital. And when I got there, I stayed there, I don't know, a few days, and they were gonna send me home again. And I said to them, I don't feel like I'm ready to go home yet. Mm -hmm. And he said, why? I said, because I think I have a blocked artery. And they did the test and I was right. I had a blocked artery. So that's when they decided, you know what? We're just going to give you the LVAD right. because it will probably save your life. Right. And the LVAD surgery was monumental. It's a really big surgery. And it takes many, many hours to complete. So... When I came out of uh, surgery, they had me in intensive care. Mm -hmm. And I remember, now mind you, anytime you get a heart surgery, they have to crack your chest open. Right. This was my fourth heart surgery. So the prior three surgeries, they had to go through all that scar tissue. And I remember the pain was just so tremendous, I couldn't even stand up straight. Mm -hmm. I was bent over, like from the shoulders down, because I, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't stand up straight. But they gave me therapy, even when I didn't really want to do therapy, they made me sit in the chair every day, you know. I had to sit in the chair for hours, sit in the chair, do therapy. 
And they finally, on October the 25th, they released me from the hospital and sent me here to the new Jewish home. And um, this is where I've been ever since. I was supposed to get an apartment. They promised me an apartment here, but they haven't done anything toward that goal. So here I sit. But the Elvat is hard sometimes. You know, it's something sticking out your body. And when I do travel, I have to take those heavy batteries, two of those heavy batteries, and I have to put them in a carrying case and carry them. It's very cumbersome. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, there was many times here that I was still thriving. Right. I came here in 2018, October the 25th, and I stayed in bed. I had lost my appetite after the operation completely. I didn't eat anything, nothing. And I'm laying in bed one day, and I said to myself, you got to get out of this bed. And I got up and I had like a manual wheelchair. Yeah. And I remember I went outside and I wheeled myself all the way down to 106th Street and Central Park West, yeah. which is like two blocks that way. Right. And when I got down there, that was the easy part. Getting back was the hard part. Yeah. I was like, yo, what did I get myself into? But I did it every single day, sometimes two and three times a day, till I got stronger. Yeah. And that's how I got stronger when I was here. I didn't really depend on the, the therapy they had here. Yeah. I depended on going out and getting fresh air and doing something else. And that's how I got stronger. Yeah. Then, the, um, then the pandemic came in 2020. Mm -hmm. And that was a nightmare. Yeah. It was a nightmare for this whole facility. How was it for you going through what you're going through and seeing just what's happening, people falling, like dying around you? It was scary. And then one day I went outside. I went down to 106th Street and I could just feel my breathing just start to change. And I knew that something was wrong. I got a little bit paranoid. But then God gave me peace. And so I came back up here. And I remember when I, I got to 106th Street in Columbus, the air was just poisonous. You can taste it. It was just poisonous. You can taste that the air just tasted different in New York City. So I went down closer to Amsterdam and the air was a little bit better there. And the, the, the air quality didn't get all the way down to um, Amsterdam yet. But then I remember I came upstairs and I caught a fever. And then I knew I was sick. And I felt like every time I tried to take a breath, my, my breathing would get stuck like right here in the middle of my chest and it wouldn't go any further. So I called my doctors and told them that I tested positive for COVID. And these people, I'm talking about here, yeah. they didn't even want to send me to the hospital. They would have let me die here. I don't really talk about that to a lot of people, but that's one of the negative things that I've went through here. Mm -hmm. They would have let me die here. And my, I had to call my sister and my sister called here and she said, what are you gonna let my brother die? Yeah. That's when they sent me to the hospital. I had even called my doctor and I told him I'm positive. They talked to me for a few minutes and just broke the connection. So I went to the hospital. They, I was in intensive care for a few days. Then they sent me to a regular room. Thank God I was never on a ventilator. Thank God for that because ventilators are really not good for the body. And it took me a long time to recover. So I got out the hospital in late March. And it took me all the way from March, all the way to about July, to feel completely like myself again. It was hard. My body hurt everywhere. Every part of your body that could hurt, I was in like such pain that I, I didn't think I could deal with it. My head hurt, and I already had bone problems. So it only compounded my problems even more. Then, after that little incident happened, the drive line in my LVAC got infected. The whole wire got infected. I was telling people for months here and at Mount Sinai that I felt like I was getting an infection. Nobody did anything. They didn't do a swab, which is what they're supposed to do. They did no swab. And then one day, on August 16th, 2020, I woke up and I thought I was paralyzed. I tried to lift my trunk of my body off the bed and I, I couldn't even move. I thought I was actually paralyzed from, from the chest down. Yeah. And so the pain was so tremendous right here 
that I just laid in one spot for like two days and I couldn't even move. And then the fever came. And I told the people here that I want to go to the hospital. They sent some, I don't even know who these people were, some EM, EMT people. And he said, we're going to give you, uh, we're going to start a line on you because our job is to keep you here. I said, wait a minute, what do you mean keep me here? I said, if you don't take me to the hospital, I'm going to call somebody else. He said, so you want to go to the hospital? Because these crazy people probably told him that I didn't want to go to the hospital. So I went to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, my white blood cell count was 41,000. Your normal white blood cell count is like about 5,000. Mine was 41,000 and I had sepsis. The infection was already in my blood already. So I remember the pain was just, it was just something that I would never really, even if I had a bad, uh, worse than me, which I don't, I would never wish the kind of pain that I had. I stayed in the hospital for 12 days. They sent me back here. So basically from late August all the way to November, I, 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 I stayed on one side of the bed like this because I really couldn't move. And it was, it was devastating. So then, to make matters worse, that December, I, I had a massive heart attack. I had a massive heart attack. I went to the hospital. They told me that my heart had taken a big hit from the heart attack. So all of those things, the pandemic, the driveline infection, and the heart attack all happened within, in less than a year. But all through those times, I asked God, I said, God, you know what? I'm going to lay my body on your altar yeah. and I ask you to carry me because I can't, I can't do it by myself. And God carried me. So all of those things that I just mentioned happened in the course of less than a year. So that was devastating physically. And then in 2021, the infection started coming back in my blood like every month. And every time the infection came back, it came back a little stronger than the last time. So the fever started getting higher. I started getting more weaker. And there were times where they actually didn't think I was gonna make it in the hospital. Cause sepsis is a really bad thing for the body to go through. Once the infection gets in your blood, it can potentially kill you. So, you know, there was times that I was in the hospital where they asked me about my quality of life. Oh, Mr. Simmons, how's the quality of life from before you got the infection? I said, it was a 10. They said, and now that you have the infection, what is your quality of life like now? I said, a 10. They said, are you, are you serious? I said, of course. I said, I don't value my life by how much pain I go through or sickness. I value my life by how much I enjoy life and living. And I enjoy life to the fullest every single day. They said, you're very amazing because most people would not say that. Because they expected me to say that my quality of life had decreased to the point where I wanted to die. But I was not going to say that. As long as I have one scintilla of breath left in my body to breathe, I'm going to live. And I'm going to give to God glory and I'm going to live. So it's been a struggle for like about a year and some change. The infection kept coming back in my blood. Then last year, like around June, they finally found an antibiotic that keeps the infection from killing me. So... I have to take antibiotics for the rest of my life because the whole machine in my body, everything's infected. I did a PET scan and it showed that the, the wires and all the machinery of the LVAT, everything just lit up in the scan. And if it lights up, that means it's infected. So everything was infected. I had a pacemaker here and a defibrillator that was also infected by the infection. They had to take that out. So it was the lesser of two evils. They felt that if they took out the LVAT, that I probably would not make it through the surgery. So they said, you know, we're gonna take out the pacemaker. And they took that out and all the wires were like, really had a lot of infection in it. So since last June, I have been infection free because I take antibiotics like every eight hours. And I would imagine that if they, if I stopped taking antibiotics, that I'd probably be dead in like six months. So, you know, it's daunting to think about death, but if I die with Christ in my heart, I'm okay with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm okay with that. How was your faith in God? 
prepped you in terms of going through all of this? Talk to me about your faith. How has it helped you? Well, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior many years ago. Um, I was locked up in Philadelphia, and there was a man named Stuart, and he worked in the mess hall, and he'd come by my cell every night with like a sandwich or something from the mess hall, which is better than the food that we was getting, because it was, you know, good stuff. But he would always preach to me about Jesus every day when he got to my cell, and I would listen to him. And he was like, you know, you got to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, brother. So I decided to make that decision and accept Christ. That's my Lord and Savior. That was 1989 that that happened in. And I backslid many times. Many, many times I backslid and went back into the same life that I was, that I was in before. But God has always been merciful and gracious to me. So like in 2010, it's like God just started speaking to me even more in my heart. Yeah. The things that you're, you've been doing, it's not pleading to me and you have to stop. So I decided that I was going to make a, a, a bigger change in my life. And hanging out and doing things that I was doing, I just left that alone in my life. And everything that I went through in my life, God has brought me through. I know it wasn't me. Um, even though medication was involved in the LVAD, it's God who gives men of science the wisdom to do these things. Without the wisdom of God, they would not be able to give a person an LVAD or come up with an antibiotic. So God has his hand in the affairs of everything that men do, men and women do, God's hand is involved in that. And I know that. So every day that I wake up here, whether I'm in tremendous pain, which I usually am, every day that I wake up, I'm very grateful and humbled to just be alive. Just looking over your life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that you're most reflective on that you will always remember in your life? Becoming a writer. Becoming a writer. I still just cannot believe that after all these years, I still think like a writer all the time. I always think about the next great story to write or the next great poem to write. And I love to share my art with other people because if God gives you a talent, whatever that talent is, and you keep it to yourself, you always be poor. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be poor spiritually. I don't want to be poor mentally. Mm -hmm. So I share my art with other people because I want to be the person who God has gifted to be a writer who wants to make a change in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't want to write about drugs and about, about sex mm -hmm. and, and, and about murder yeah. and misogyny and everything that we hear in music that's so horrible and, and bad and wrong. I want to be the kind of person that that put something of value into the world. Because love is like a vibration. Love is a vibration. If you put the vibration of love into the universe, God will send it back to you somehow. You don't know how it's going to happen, but you know that it will happen because God, that's God's promise to us. To love. We have to love our brothers. We have to love our sisters. We have to love those who are not like us, who don't believe like us. We may not understand or believe what they believe, but we still have respect for them nonetheless. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that I don't agree with in society, but nonetheless, I have respect for all people. Yeah. And um, I love my friends. Yeah. My friends mean a lot to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I want my friends to be inspired. Yeah. I don't want my friends to be sad. I don't want them to, to wallow in despair. Yeah. I want them to be upbeat and happy. I know that's not possible every day. But if I can help it, I'm going to make sure I impress that upon them all the time. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good part because I want to ask you this. For persons who are watching, for yeah. persons who are watching, and they're going through their own struggles, and they're going through their own trials, yeah. and they see you went through yours and came out and fell down to your faith. What is that message you want to give to those persons? They're struggling with whatever they're struggling with. For you, what you experience and still held on to faith and be strong and positive, what's that message you want to give to them? I just want to say that no matter what a human being can go through, there's always Christ. And you can always turn to him. He promised to bear our burdens and our sicknesses. And you know, he died on the cross for the sake of humanity, to take away our sins to take away our sickness. 
You will never be perfected in this lifetime. But if you keep your faith in Jesus Christ and you die as a faithful person, when you open your eyes, you will open your eyes in glory. And that's my hope. Um, Jesus Christ went through more than any other human being has ever went through in the course of history. What they did to him before when they crucified him. You know, how his body was marred and destroyed. They destroyed the Lord. But nonetheless, he was obedient to God the Father because he knew that it was for a greater good to save humanity. Because at one time we were separated from God because of sin. But Jesus Christ took the sin of the world and God nailed him to the cross. And by his stripes we are healed and I feel that I'm healed. And my message to anybody else is to keep your faith in Jesus Christ no matter what. No matter what somebody says, no matter what you see on TV, no matter what you read in the newspapers, God is always watching and he always cares. All you have to do is this. I was reading a scripture last night that was God was telling Israel, he said, return unto me and I'll return unto you. If we return to God, he will come back to us. Even when we're disobedient, God still blesses us. You know, God just doesn't love the, God just doesn't love the, um, the quote unquote righteous or whatever, but God loves the sinner. He doesn't like the sin, but he loves the sinner. And that's my message to anybody. Keep your faith in Christ. Um, I want to ask you my final question. Okay. For those persons who want to say, how you want persons to see you, the Don Simmons. Mm -hmm. so may not know who you are. What's that one thing that you want persons to remember you as? I want people to remember me as being a faithful, a faithful person to God, a faithful person to Christ. I want people to remember me for the art that I put out there, because art, I love art. Now, you know, I'm not just an, um, a writer and a poet, but I'm also a photographer. So I see the, like, the beauty in everything. I want people to remember me that I always gave them good advice, I never stared them down the wrong road, and I was always a good friend. That's how I want to be remembered. Thank you. Thank you for coming. It has been a pleasure. The pleasure was mine. It really was. That was our conversation with Don Simmons. I want to say thank you so much for watching and join us next time on the next episode of Health and Wellness. I'm your host, Dr. Rosenberg.